they still have this mentality that, you know, they, a kid comes in with this cell phone and they, you know, they're hitting them in the back of the head saying, go put your phone in the truck rather than, than building around the technology that these kids were born with in their hand, you know? So we have a product development division where we build tools, equipment, and solutions for the industry. You're listening to Toolbox of the Trades, brought to you by Service Titan, a podcast for top service professionals where we interview leaders for their best tips and tricks of the trades. Learn how industry trailblazers stay ahead of the competition and how you too can be at the forefront of an industry. Let's jump in. Hello, contractors, and welcome to the Toolbox for the Trades. By the time he was 33 years old, Justin Armendariz had started and sold three contracting companies. Now he's the owner of Better Future Facilities, aka BFF, a $40 million full-service commercial facilities maintenance company specializing in plumbing. Walmart's actually one of their major clients. Armandaris and BFF are on the cutting edge of technology. Think body cams and in-truck training that he believes can be applied to both commercial and residential operations. Enjoy. Justin Armandaris, welcome to the Toolbox for the Trades podcast. Cool. Thanks for having me, Jackie. I am super excited to chat with you. I've heard nothing but great things uh, from my fellow colleagues about you. Uh, so for the folks who may not know who you are, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself? Uh, well, I'm Justin Armandadis. I've been in the trades uh, effectively my entire life. Um, grew up in the trades. Uh, father was a painting contractor. Um, he moved away when I was uh, about 14 years old uh, to, to take a job in another state running a company. And I kind of just picked up where he left off. I was really fortunate to uh, go to work for a painting contractor that was local. And uh, when he kind of retired, I took over his operations. And when I was 20, uh, I sold that business. And from there, um, I started into the general construction work, started building uh, high-end residential homes. Uh, Really enjoyed that work for a long time and uh, rode that right up until 2008. Uh, we had four or five um, really solid contracts still in the books. Fortunately, our clients weren't really affected by um, by the whole the economic downturn, but it did give me the advantage to really look around and see what I was going to do next. And uh, we were able to sell that business and we moved on to doing general construction work, which um, led us into working for school districts and uh, hospitals and different public works entities. And uh, we grew that business to about 40 million in four years. And then uh, we unloaded it to the biggest uh, contractor in the state, which we had kind of put a dent in their, in their revenue. So they weren't too excited about it, but they were happy to buy it. Um, And when I, when I did that, they gave me a non-competition agreement and that non-competition agreement pretty much said I could do anything except for pull a permit. So my entire lifelong livelihood was kind of put to a stop. So I went uh, back to the drawing board and figured out that uh, most service work didn't require a permit. And um, I really didn't have a footprint in the residential space anymore. And also uh, my other residential companies, I really identified the fact that scaling a residential company uh, can be quite challenging because a lot of times the clients are attached uh, not only emotionally to their proper property, but emotionally to the contractor. So I didn't want to leave myself in that position again, because I felt like when I exited the other uh, residential companies that they suffered when I was gone, uh, not from a lack of process and procedure, but from not having that 24 hour a day, you know, seven day a week customer service that I brought to the table. So I I didn't want to leave anybody in that position again. So um, I really looked at what we could do to enter the space from a a facilities standpoint. And uh, I think our first contract was uh, repainting the interiors of the uh, Victoria's Secrets. And uh, we would go and fix all of the uh, drawers and just do a bunch of little stuff like that. And after about uh, six months or so, we looked at the books and we figured out that all the money was coming in through plumbing and electrical. And we decided that uh, we wanted to do that type of work going forward. So we sat down, lined out a plan. And then we started to realize that 
uh, Walmart and some of these big uh, contractors were willing to pay for like the speed and the quality that we brought to the table. So we really um, lined out a solid set of goals for the, for the next 18 months to kind of make those our biggest uh, indirect clients. And that kind of uh, got us, it got us to a point where we got our foot in the door with Walmart and we, we went to them and, you know, we were about six months old at the time and uh, they kind of laughed us out of the door, which was really funny. I tell everybody that they're like, who are you? They didn't know who we were or what we had been doing. And um, they told us that, uh, you know, we needed to have about five years of experience under our belt, this, that, and the other. So we asked the question, you know, who, who is doing this work? And it turned out that it was, um, some of the larger property management firms in the world were doing the work. So we made uh, the goal to make Walmart our biggest indirect client. And we went to work for these other guys and we spent uh, about five years really, or not five years, but about four years really understanding the space and the market and what was needed in the industry. And I guess probably about three years into it, we had expanded to about 10 states and we're working um, a, a decent amount of people. And uh, the companies that we were making look really good, which were these middle men that were just pushing paper from Walmart to us, uh, started to get acquired by, by these huge property management firms. And about one and a half billion dollars changed hands in about eight months and our five largest accounts were acquired. Well, they were wow. acquired. Yeah, it was incredible. They were inquired by or, or acquired by, um, you know, CBRE, your largest publicly traded uh, property management firm with, uh, you know, 25,000 self-performing techs and a four and a half billion dollar service department. And uh, some of the other acquisitions were by their direct competitors, number one, two and three. Uh, whether they're privately or publicly traded, but these guys are working for our clients on five continents. So they were uh, forced to be reckoned with, but uh, we kind of made it as hard on them as we could. And we pulled up uh, stakes and closed all our offices with about 10 days notice. And uh, we were fortunate. We were in a super uh, uh, good financial position that let us do that. And what we did was we went to Walmart direct and they're, they're, our, they're the kind of the customer that we really like to shoot for because their standards so high. Uh, if you can work for them and turn a profit, you can pretty much work for anybody. But we kind of went that route and uh, enjoyed it. And uh, we got ranked the number one uh, contractor to Walmart in uh, 2019 out of 3,800 competitors. Um, by about a 20 point margin. So that's kind of uh, the short story of how we got to where we're at currently. And now, um, you know, to be completely honest with you, and I, I keep saying this to people, uh, I figure it'll manifest itself eventually. We are <clears throat> super excited about uh, raising a fund in order to buy up some of the premier contractors in the country and go and compete against these guys. So that's kind against of Against CBRE? We're at. Correct. Dang. Super okay, excited. well, yeah, that's not impressive or anything, Justin. Uh, it looks like you sold three businesses uh, before 2012, and you uh, basically have snabbed Walmart as a customer from the property management giants that uh, took up all of your customers. Is that correct? Yeah, they are still uh, the largest provider to Walmart, uh, as well as others, but they're unable to produce the metric numbers that we can produce. So Walmart's a great example. Um, they have a thousand plumbers working for them already. So we're partnered with them to train their people as well as partnered with CBRE to train their people as well. So it, it's, it's getting the metrics out. And when we turn in a 20 point higher margin than the next, uh, the next best competitor, um, We've been really fortunate. That's all I can say. Process and procedure. Dang. Like, process and procedure. Focused. Process and procedure is the drum that keeps getting, that people keep beating every time they come on this podcast. I'm so happy you said that. Um, so first off, you're a little bit different than some of my standard guests. Uh, I usually interview people who run uh, residential services, whereas you're 100% commercial. Is that correct? Uh, correct. And you had kind of already mentioned it in uh, your answer before, which is that you wanted to develop a commercial business 
because you felt like in residential there in your previous residential business there was a tie to you as the owner and you really wanted to create something larger than yourself correct yeah i wanted to make sure that we uh, that i didn't build another business that was attached to me mm -hmm. got it I wanted I, I really, uh, you know, it took me until my early 30s to develop a personal mission statement, you know, and when I did, it's, uh, that's when things got a lot more clear to me. And I heard um, uh, Weldon Long on your show talk about this a bunch, but, uh, you know, that personal mission statement for me is to help as many people as possible uh, achieve their goals and succeed at happiness, you know, and I really get excited about helping people. So uh, it's, it's a lot easier to build something scalable and to put uh, you know i think that the best way to help those people is just give people something to do with themselves put them to work and educate them mm -hmm. and make them very clear as to what their expectations are what your expectations are of them and so this way they can exceed them uh yeah. the key to happiness that you heard right here on toolbox for the trades um so my immediate question when you were kind of talking about your history is you know you grew up in the trades obviously how did you attain all of this business knowledge? I mean, to have sold, so guessing on your age here, sounds like you sold three businesses before you were 30? Uh, the third one was or in 13 and um, it was, oh, what was it, 33. So we started this business when I was uh, 33 and, then, and now I'm 38, so uh, just moving along. I will tell you the service business has been the hardest business I've ever, ever done. I mean, getting to 40 million in revenue at a, you know, $5 million per ticket is easy compared to getting to even 10 million at $500 a ticket. You know, uh, I got a lot of respect for the guys that work in this business. It's a, it's a challenge. Yeah. You mean like this residential service business or just the. Uh, on both sides. I mean, if you have to service anything, you know, and you get $500 a ticket, it takes a long time to add those up into the millions of dollars, you know, so these guys that, you know, have 10 and $20 million service companies, it, it's tough to get there. Totally. So how did you get to 40 million? Uh, well, in that, that was in general construction work. So, you know, when you're doing a $5 million ticket, you get there pretty quick. Oh, got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so besides the residential side on, you know, not wanting your personality attached to the business, is there any other reason why you chose to go commercial all the way? Cause I, whenever I speak to residential contractors, they're always like, I want that COD business. I want that cash on delivery. I don't want to be in accounts receivables. So it sounds like you have a completely different point of view. Can you talk to me about that? Yeah, definitely. So when we really sat down and figured out where we wanted to go, um, and a long-term goal is to get us to an IPO, right? So we can compete in a, in a much larger space. And um, the industry, it really needs a good uh, kick, right? To get where it's going. And I, I know that it's, um, one of the questions that you had sent me over to review was, you know, what do I see that's lacking in the industry? And it's that speed quality and technology, you know, it's just not a thing. Nobody's consistent. Everybody's doing their own thing. Every plumber that has a license is his own business. And I'm all about it. Every person, you know, if you can go out there and do it, that's great. But organizing that, that effort together, you know, gives us a huge opportunity. And I, I guess at the end of the day, um, when we really started looking at technology and where the industry's going and what kind of things are happening um, in the world, a good example is uh, Walmart, right? And Amazon, they have this in-home uh, delivery service, right? They, you order groceries, you're off at work or off wherever you are. They come into your home, they restock your refrigerator. It's on a live video feed. So <clears throat> we run the entire uh, company on a live video feed, at least from a technician standpoint. And if anybody has any sense at all, you can kind of see the writing on the wall. In a very short order, you're going to be able to log on to Amazon's website, Walmart's website, and order in-home service. So I figured if we could get ranked number one with these companies, which are those are some of our biggest clients, that we will be first in line to provide in-home service when it's time to, to deliver in home service. So we're constantly pitching them the idea. It's like, look, give us a little regional market to, to provide in home service. You go on the website, you order your, I need a toilet repair from Walmart or an HVAC repair from Walmart. And you know, we come in and take care of it. 
and Walmart's primed to do the same. And I, I, I don't know about Amazon as much because we, they're super segregated on their um, facility side, but uh, at, at Walmart in general, most of their stuff's handled in house. And um, they, they have, uh, they're, they're almost like completely self-performing on the HVAC side. And like I said before, they're working close to a thousand plumbers already. Um, so they have the ability to, to, to self-perform that type of work too. But the number one thing was, I figured if we could go to work for these big clients, get a national footprint, it would give us not only an ability to compete against the bigger um, players in the industry, which are actually just hiring the smaller guys anyway, but it would also give us that ability to really change the way the industry runs and bring that consistency at a national level that's not ever really been there. Interesting. So in a, I have so many questions. And before I even ask a single one, I'm going to clarify that the name of your business is Better Future Facilities, which we have not yet set on the, um, on the air yet. Um, so in a world where, say, you, know, you get in with these big clients like Walmart and Amazon, let's say five, 10 years down the line, you're ordering on-demand service while you're at work at your home, would BFF better future facilities then potentially pivot to residential service? Or are you thinking of a model where maybe uh, Walmart and Amazon pay you as the dealer and they kind of deal with the transaction from the customer's point of view? Does that make sense? Uh, it does. So yeah, our, the goal was to get back to residential, but to have a national footprint by the time that we needed to do so. And if you're in with the, the biggest customers in the world that are operating on every continent, uh, that gives you a huge opportunity to kind of just step in and, and provide that service. And I think historically in commercial and residential, there's, it, it's very far from one another as far as quality, um, it, it, maybe not quality, but as far as appearance and expectation. Uh, typically, you know, the, the guy that's trudging around Walmart's dirty and, you know, it is what it is and Walmart is not really asking a lot of questions and you don't want to send that person into uh, someone's home. And if I was going to build a residential plumbing service company, you know, those guys would come in with the booties on their shoes and the whole nine yards. Well, that's kind of what we're building on the commercial site already so that we have mm -hmm. that easy transition. We use a body cam on the technician in order to see what they're doing 24 hours a day. That way, if they're inside of anywhere, we can log right in and see what they're doing and how it's going. We can uh, talk to them through an earpiece um, and also see uh, and support them in real time. So, and that's a big piece of, uh, of the quality. And I know that you have a question wrapped around. So. I do. I, I almost regret asking you these, sharing you these questions before because you're naturally answering them, but I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I'm really fascinated with this whole virtual technician uh, concept here because, you know, one of the big differences between residential and commercial, and one of the reasons why Service Titan was wasn't available to commercial, you know, at the beginning is that we pride ourselves on being able to empower contractors to deliver end to end experience with a customer, right? Like, so it's like you're ordering a pizza through Postmates or you're ordering an Uber, you know, like the homeowner gets to track the technician on their way. They get all these forms and all these follow ups. But it sounds like you've completely done a a leapfrog over service titan on the commercial space and you're providing your commercial customers with live feeds of what the technician is doing. So talk to me about how that really differentiates you from other commercial contractors and you know how you even came up with that idea. And also, if you don't mind, how do you how do you do it? Yeah, that's a great question. So, <laughs> uh honestly, I was very fortunate um between uh, exiting uh, the company in 2013, uh, I moved to uh, San Francisco and I lived there for about uh, 18 months or so. And I really just wanted to go learn the tech space and understand, you know, what was going on and what made them, you know, why is there so much wealth populated in this one county in, in California, right? Um, so I went out there and I really learned like the scrum mod model and uh, the agile format. And when I brought that back um, and got into the service space, it left me it left me working effectively with no box around me and from a very open mindset. So we were, I will tell you that probably the number one thing that has helped us is we could never find anybody from our industry 
to do the work the way that we thought it should be done. Everybody had this mentality as like, well, it's always been done like this. And I'm like, well, it just, I, I can't help you just cause it's always been done like that doesn't mean it's right. And uh, we started hiring retailers. So we started hiring former uh, retail managers, people who are expected to work seven days a week. They're young, fast, edgy, uh, metrics driven, something that's not common in our space. Well, that led us to hiring younger technicians, uh, less qualified than somebody who's been doing it for 10 or 15 years. And we needed to come up with a support system for those technicians. So um, first, uh, we just asked them questions. Right? I, I'm the number, I'm the first one uh, to, to always ask the questions to the technicians, to the customers. And uh, I'll, I'll share these with you. I think these are great for, for all contractors, for anybody in life to ask. But the three questions are, uh, you know, what are you doing? Uh, what are we doing that you love? What are we doing that you want to see us stop doing immediately? And what is a competitor doing that um, you want to see us start doing? And then act on it quickly. And I think Elon Musk says this best. He says, don't tell me what you like about my product. Tell me what you hate about it. You know, and it's right. And if you can get people to give you honest feedback wrapped around those three questions, you end up in a really powerful place, especially if you can deliver the result uh, to, to show the customer or the, the technician that, that you're serious about it. Um, so fortunately, we kind of were built from a place of necessity, right? We were trying to solve this problem that we didn't quite know what it was. And everybody that was coming to us in the industry had this mindset that, you know, this is the way it's done. And, and I'll tell you, even in the last five years, I've seen a ton of great contractors coming online that are using more technology. Um, and especially in the residential space, because service Titan especially makes it, it you're super empowering, right? To, to help contractors become great. Um, so, so that's good. And that's one of the reasons I was willing to really work with service Titan to get to the next uh, level um, on a commercial standpoint. Uh, we were kind of ranked best in class uh, for commercial space. And you guys are definitely ranked first in class uh, from a residential space. And I figured if I could work with y'all to, to bring that to the same place, it'd be best for both of us. Um, but at the end of the day, asking the technicians, you know, what do they need? Uh, constantly, they need support. They need more training. So for, for an example, instead of bringing them into a classroom and training them, um, after we send them out to the field, we uh, will we have uh, tablets in the vehicle, and we run two technicians 100% um, of the time. So one technician's driving, or the other technician's driving. They take turns, and if we dispatch them to say a, a clog call, we automatically are feeding live stream video into their vehicle to retrain them on the tools and equipment as they're en route to that job. Just a refresher, two minute refresher on this is how the equipment works. Two minute refresher on this, on, uh, this is the type of uh, clog that this client typically experiences. And just those types of things where it's real time training that's always on based on the call that's coming in. Um, and I that's incredible, that's by important. the way. That's, I want to pause there. That is incredible. So you've figured out a way to actually feed your technicians information on the job they're about to go on in real time as they're driving there, essentially. Yeah. And, and I know that you guys have done an excellent job at, at building a segue to that, which is ranking the contractor or racing, ranking the technician based on what they're great at, right? Well, yep. we want every technician to be great at everything, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of a long shot. But at the same time, at least giving them uh, the opportunity to get on site and to have a refresher on a piece of equipment that maybe they haven't taken out in a couple of weeks. Um, it's just, it, it, it's hugely beneficial. Uh, not only that, the, it keeps them engaged. And mm -hmm. then uh, something that I've been talking to Lev uh, from your team about is uh, when we transitioned to Service Titan, we actually experienced a decrease in first time completions. And one of the things that sets us apart and it gives us the ability to keep our price really low is the fact that um, we keep that first time completion rate over 90%. And if mm -hmm. we can keep it closer to 95, it's huge, right? Because typically a contractor will come out and, you know, maybe the average ticket is $500. And if they have to leave the site or they have to come back with parts, now you're now, now the uh, price is like 750, 800, $900. And by us having a 
percent first time completion rate, we're in a place where we can continually drive the costs down right through efficiencies. So it's just a lot of little things like that. But the thing I was telling you, I was working with Lev on is internal social media. So we built a platform and, and Service Titan has a piece of it where you can communicate from, you know, CSR or project manager to technician, but we want all of the technicians in any given hub working together. So our first time completion rate fell off about 10 or 12% once we implemented Service Titan because they stopped using the internal social media platform we built. So mm. now I'm like pushing on Lev, hey, we need this internal social media platform. And the way that we have constructed and built it is so that every time they get a piece of training, they get a badge. Every time uh, they complete a job, they get points, you know, all these different things. And they can use their points to buy tools. They can use their um, badges. Uh, if they get a certain amount of badges, they achieve another level. They get, you know, different bonuses. And it's all about just giving it to the technicians, everything that we can and keeping them engaged. And I think the average age of a plumber in this country is 48 years old. Um, and a service plumber is like 51 years old and our average age of a technician is under 30. So that's great. Uh, it's important though. If you're going to change the way the industry runs, like you've got to get your head wrapped around this and get it done guys. So yeah, the union, um, they really, I think, uh, let the country down and, and let the world down in that, in that risk in regard, uh, you know, your largest union in the world that's operating in, in, uh, five countries, uh, or, or five major uh, areas, I guess is the easier way to say that. <clears throat> These guys, uh, after September 11th, you know, we saw a reduction of trade schools in this country by about 80% within 24 months. Well, you know, you fast forward 20 years to where we're at right now, and you wonder why the average age of the, the technician is 50. I mean, well, come on, guys, we didn't train anybody. And, you know, I hate to beat up on the union, but at the end of the day, like they still have this mentality that, you know, they, a kid comes in with his cell phone and, they, you know, they're hitting him in the back of the head saying, go put your phone in the truck rather than, than building around the technology that these kids were born with in their hand, you know? So I, I, we have a product development division where we build tools, equipment, and solutions for the industry. And we've built a, a snake uh, that we haven't released yet or a sewer machine, these guys call them. And it's uh, fully automated and controlled by the telephone. And we love the thing. I can't wait to really roll it out on a national scale. But my point to, to that was when I went to the engineering team, I'm like, look, guys, I pulled out the, the equipment and, and we looked at it. And the thing was built in 1940. So the thing is, it's Ancient. fundamentally exactly the same from 1980 till now. And when we started on the project, it was 2017. And it's like I told him, this thing needs to be sleek. It needs to be sexy. It needs to have, um, be fully controlled by the telephone. And it needs to look like it came out of the trunk of a Tesla. I mean, that's all I can tell you guys. And uh, they came back with a really nice product and we're, we're starting to test it and we're looking for a partner to manufacture it. Um, but it, it's like the industry has to come to the 20th century. It's just, it, it's incredible how far behind the industry is. Uh, I agree. And the whole point you just made about the average age of a technician right now and the fact that your technicians are mostly under 30, I really want to give you kudos to that. It sounds like you've really, exactly what you said, I, I know, I've noticed what this generation wants and I've adapted my business model for it. Um, actually, the whole badge and point system, I'm like, yeah, that sounds like a LMS, a learning management system. Like, duh, that sounds great. Yeah. And in terms, I just, I'm so curious, how, how do you have the virtual body cam? Like, I need to know what this setup looks like. Uh, it's a, exactly the same um, thing like a police department would use. Yeah. Uh, and then we kind of fit it up. So uh, everything we do is super tech enabled. So we're partnered with Verizon um, and the, uh, the unit, um, the, the vans that we use, and we just started switching to a van model, but these vans are like, they're hot spots, right? And everything's uh, fully tech enabled. Uh, they're just constantly streaming video back to the van and then it's uploading, uploading to us. And then if we get in a situation where the connectivity is poor or we can't get service, then we'll automatically switch them to a cell phone. But I'll tell you, it's a huge thing. Like the first time that we asked some of our national clients uh, to come onto a live video feed and kind of look at the project, they were blown away. I mean, it was like instant deal sold. What are you guys doing over there? 
Um, and we use that a lot to, to sell quality, right? It, it, and I think that's a, a huge selling point, even for a residential contractor. Um, if you can tell your, your customer doesn't want to go in there and check the quality of the work that the technician did. So getting no. a second set of eyes on it from a quality standpoint and just running through a general checklist and saying, oh yeah, that looks great guys. Or, hey, show me this, show me that. Uh, okay, is this tight? You know, just little things that when a technician, it, it does something every single day, um, you know, they might miss and it's, it's not that they're, they're lazy or they don't want to do it. It's just that, um, it, you know, it's like when you move into a brand new house, right? You see every little imperfection of the home and you fix as many of them as you can and the rest stay on the list. And if they don't ever get fixed, you just forget about them. They just become oblivious. They become part of your reality. So, you know, given the technician, the ability to have someone to lean on, I think is huge. And I don't know, um, if we've talked much about it, or if we were going to, but uh, training and recruitment in this industry, whoever gets that right wins. I mean, that's the yeah. next the next thing, right? Like you've got to be able to recruit these uh, kids into the trades. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being a tradesman. Um, I, I heard you saying on the show the other day that you know the tradesmen they make a lot of money. I think uh, like most of our average technicians make sixty, seventy thousand dollars in a rural area. So I think yeah. that's uh, really good money for somebody coming out of high school. So uh, I mean, yeah, I, Justin. Yeah, I had, to work, I had to work my butt off to get to that. You know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. Same, dude. <laughs> so uh, it is what it is, and uh, it, but it's a recruitment. And in my vision, if we're going to build a training program, you've got to. You, it, I went to a tech school. Um, that I had a scholarship to go to. And I went for about six months. I didn't finish uh, the thing. It just didn't seem like it was going where I wanted it to. But uh, some of the guys that I, uh, fin that I went to school with, they, they finished. And, you know, I reach out to them once in a while. And I'm like, hey, you know, have you heard from the school or anything like that? I mean, it's 10 years later. No, I've never heard from them again. And when we build a training and recruitment program, it's never going to be like that. I want to support that technician with a live video feed for the rest of his career. And when he's a ready to transition from, you know, the aging to emerging workforce, and, and that's how we coin our training department and our video closeout department is we take those guys who are, you know, 50 years old and ready to stop hanging pipe in the field. And we bring them uh, in behind a video camera. We let them work from home or from the beach or wherever the hell they want to work from. And then they get to sub more support the emerging workforce, right? So and it's like, hey, you know, I'm stuck on a call right now. I'm a young kid. I dial in. This guy picks up the phone from wherever he's at and guess what? He gets to help me and he gets to share his knowledge and experience with me. And we, like I said, we call that, uh, it, um, you know, joining the aging and, and emerging workforces together through that live video feed. But it's just, I, uh, I blown away, Justin, really. Uh, I think you're really forward thinking, uh, and I'm, I I'm really that. amazed by it. I, I haven't talked to many people who think the way you do. Um, in terms of, I'm like, I like, don't know where to go next, Justin. You've completely just floored me. <laughs> um, I really want to, well, actually, yes, I do. Back, going back to the live video feed, you mentioned that when you shared that with a customer or with a potential customer, it was like, that's it, done, deal closed. You just completely differentiated yourself from all the other commercial contractors. From what I've heard about in the space is that commercial contractors do a really poor job of following up with their customer, of maintaining that line of communication. So is this just one of the ways that you've really been able to stay sticky and top of mind for all of your clients? You know, that and uh, having a clever name like Call Your BFF really helps. So if you're going to, if you're going to make a name in a big ocean uh, <laughs> and you're not going to come in with tens of thousands of technicians to do it, you better have something that gets their attention. And um, <clears throat> we're all about communication, right? So it's speed, quality, and technology, and all focused on communication. What can we, what can we do to communicate faster? What technology will help us get there? And it, if you can kind of get that headed the right direction, you got a huge advantage. And I noticed this early on. So first off, I, I, I don't want to be stuck fooling with something for days on end. And that's the thing that we've seen with the, the commercial space the most probably is you know, a technician goes out to a job site, he does his job, he gets his photos and his paperwork, he comes back to the office the next morning, and then turns that in, 
And then, uh, you know, the person trying to do the billing or whatever doesn't have what they need. They've got to call the guy. Well, at that point, you're now paying your customer to collect what information they needed. So you might as well just do it the first time. So we have super tight SLAs and we were really fortunate to work for Tesla um, early on and they, they, got a, they got us uh, doing some things a lot different than I ever could have expected. But it's just really moving with such speed and efficiency. So we try to have every single ticket that we start completed or quoted within uh, two hours. So, Amazing. and that's, that's included the billing and the whole nine yards. And it's like I said a second ago, if you don't do it in real time, you're effectively paying the customer to do the work, right? So, and our, our space uh, is really driven by time on site, which I, I think the commercial space is a little bit like that, um, but we're uh, paid by IVR GPS. So like when we get on site, we're paid, uh, you know, from the minute we're within a certain radius of a building and once we're outside of that radius, we're no longer paid. So we need to make sure that we're super fast and efficient. And probably one of our biggest competitive advantages has been um, beating up the supply chain to get faster and uh, just delivering the information quickly back to our home office so that we can get it in our customers' hands. And it gets to the point where our, our, what we instruct like our CSRs and our project managers to do is you just update your client as often and fast as possible. And if they're not complaining to stop updating them, you need to keep updating them. So, and by updating, you mean like checking in with them, seeing how the project's going, see if there's any more needs that they have. So before we get on site, our customers received uh, well, by the time we get on site and we've talking to a manager, our, our customers receive three notifications from us. They've received a in route ET, uh, an acceptance of the work. Uh, e they've received that email. Then they receive an ETA. And our, our service SLA is uh, every single work order that comes in services the same day and preferably within four hours. The industry is four hours for like an emergency work order. We're like four hours uh, for every work order. Um, and if you can't make that, you need more people. So and uh, then once we're on site, we, we send another update. So they got three updates before we've walked into the building. Once we get into the building, we make contact with the manager. Uh, we make sure that, um, that we're able to check in. Uh, once we receive um, a notification from the technician, we follow up again with the client to ensure that the IVR compliance and that they can see that we're checked in. And most clients can't keep up with this. But uh, at the end of the day, if we just keep pushing, eventually the API integration will take care of it for us, but we have to be able to build it uh, with pencil and paper in this industry before we can ever build it with software. So, um, and it's just like that. So it, there's your prime example is like four updates by the time, you know, we've just got on site and talked to the manager. And then it's about every 30 minutes after that, that we're updating the client asking for uh, NTE uh, or we're asking for uh, uh, financial increases, things of that nature. And then just sending in pictures. The, the technicians are taking the pictures into the Service Titan app. And if we uh, want to kind of log in through that body cam, we can do that and we can take the, the real-time photos as well. So uh, the technology is, you know, it's really where it's at. And, and it's, it's, it also gets all the kids, uh, at least the younger generation, really engaged in uh, what we're trying to accomplish. I mean, we're building it for them. We're not building it for us, right? Totally. hundred percent. And by kids, you mean all the new people that are coming into the trades and getting them excited and all that cool stuff. It's gotta be fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, at this point, you've already mentioned you have a product development team. You do four hour service. So you're incredibly efficient and fast. If I were listening to this interview right now, I'd be like, how big is this guy's team? How much revenue is he pulling in annually? Would you mind sharing those and just kind of talking a little bit about the breakdown of your company? Um, yeah, definitely. So we're actually uh, scaled back considerably right now because we're making a pivot. Um, mm -hmm. So we were running uh, probably 12 million coming into 2019. And then we pivoted, uh, went to work directly for our clients. And, you know, any startup, uh, which I considered us a startup uh, really until um, beginning of this year, we were looking for the problem that we were truly trying to solve and also um, who our competitors were. 
And it wasn't until the end of 2019 uh, when we got ranked uh, number one um, kind of to Walmart that they put us on a list with who our competitors were finally. So we were looking at these companies all around the country and couldn't quite figure out um, who they were, you know, how they lined up with what we were doing because everything we were doing was so fundamentally different. But we ended the year uh, in control of like the fourth most US locations. And that was kind of an eye-opening experience as well. And also I probably the biggest um, pat on the back we got was, uh, you know, these guys say, you know, here, here we set the standard, you know, this high and a better future, they set it this high. And that was kind of eye-opening. So we've really uh, pivoted and started to, to shrink, the, shrink the growth. And we're focused uh, more on training and recruitment, uh, not only of training our competition, but of training um, our, our customers, uh, in-house technicians, um, not only uh, at Walmart, but also um some of the the bigger players in the in the aerospace industry i'm super fascinated by by that industry and and what they're trying to accomplish so we're we're pretty closely aligned with some of that work um i i guess uh i couldn't tell you what the total roll-up is right now but at the beginning of this year we separated all of the companies so now we have bff inc as the parent company and then mm -hmm. we have uh, better future facilities and better future fabrication and uh, better future, uh, the, the training arm and all of these are now their own business units and better future facilities is um, actually, we're, we're moving that entire business to where we're opening individualized hubs and the hubs are owned by the technician in that area, kind of uh, like a franchise, franchise model, yeah. but in a lot, in a lot, more fundamentally helpful way. So uh, your typical franchise is you end up in this situation where, you know, you buy a business in a box, they send you out on your way, and then you never hear from them again, right? And they, <laughs> yeah. they might send you a bill every single month, which they do. And <laughs> then they, they run off another direction. And, and if any of your listeners here uh, are, are struggling with uh, growth um, and they're started their own businesses, a great book, uh, Michael Gerber's E-Myth Revisited. Yep. Excellent book. But kind of leaning on what that book talks about, it, uh, the technician struggles, we've built this model where these technicians can buy in uh, to it, to to the hub, and they can go out and they can do the work, and we'll run the business side of it. So we handle the accounting, we handle the um, collections, we handle the sales, and and they are responsible for a big chunk of sales too. But we handle like that national client sales. So uh, that that seems to be working out really well. We've got it flushed out in three markets right now, and we're slowly. Um, we'd like to get those ones really flushed out before we really just start to scale. But it's like I mentioned in the beginning, we're looking to acquire uh, some of the bigger platform companies in the country as well. And building that team is probably uh, the biggest challenge because the space is so ripe with private equity and private equity, they don't quite line up and don't get me wrong. There's a few of them, but the majority of private equity does not see things the way I do. Uh, they are very uh, short-sighted, uh, investors, right? Mm -hmm. Looking for their exit. So we hadn't had a lot of luck in the private equity space, but um, we're definitely looking for the right partners to, to, to take us to an IPO and uh, kind of move that, move that direction. But it's kind of a hybrid between the hub model that I explained to you, where we're supporting those contractors and buying some of those platform businesses that we can share our, in our efficiencies of uh, training and, um, you know, supply, uh, supply chain management. And, you know, if anybody struggles with suppliers out there, uh, you, you know, really holding those suppliers accountable is probably the best thing you can do, not only for your business, but for your customer, the, the supply chain in our industry from a, from a parts and a vendor standpoint is just horrible. So these guys are just all major players and they could care less who you are or what you have to, to offer them. So that's kind of the mentality that's got to be kind of rooted out of the industry. And the, 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 the younger generation, if they're led correctly, they'll, they'll root it out. Very interesting. I also love this hub model that you said, because it sounds like you're also empowering a technician 
by giving them their pseudo own location without having to do a lot of that, um, that work that it takes to start a business from scratch, like with the e-myth. So if they're in this kind of satellite location, they get leads from you. They also have the opportunity to explore their local commercial leads and they can work it there. Are these hubs, are they based on like, you do plumbing, you do electrical, um, or is it kind of a mix? So we look for what the technician's great at. So uh, mm. our, our, our mission statement at, uh, at BFF Inc. is taking what each and every one of us are great at and turn it into a better future for all. So we find what you're great at and we build around that. So we, we're, the business never changes, right? Like you got to pay your taxes, you got to pay your payroll, you got to pay your insurance, that part never changes. So whatever that technician's great at, let's get them trained to the nines and let them go just do right by the customer. And that's the number one we, thing we tell them. Uh, no matter what you do, just wow our customer every single day. Yeah. Uh, I've been making an observation as we've been talking, but it sounds like you have a lot of interests that are outside the trades and outside of contracting. And you found a way to insert yourself as a contractor into all of these areas that you're actually really interested in. Yeah. So, I mean, I was given the, I was given the, the gift of being good contractor, right? So I, yeah. I have to build everything around that because I've spent my entire life being a contractor. So, um, there's plenty of great companies out there to follow though, like Tesla and SpaceX. Uh, they're probably the favorite, my favorite companies to not only follow, but to work with and work for. Uh, and i have really drawn to working for the companies that have really high standards. Um, by working for them, you will be better or you will go away. So um, I, I really like that, that bringing that high standard uh, to the game. And like you kind of said, using it to everything that we can get into and touch, just bring it to the next level. And um, yeah, there's just so much. Yeah, I'm kind of lost in thought now about it. <laughs> You're like, I'm just lost in thought. Pardon me as I go meditate for a minute. No, but you had mentioned <laughs> the, scrum, the scrum and the agile process before, which for anyone who doesn't know is basically a, a web development system where they break off their releases in, in weekly chunks, and which is really cool. I'm just, from here talking to you, I'm just hearing a lot of modern day technological management practices applied to old school contracting really quality service work um, and i think that i agree with you i think that is what's going to make or break contractors of today with contractors of tomorrow now you already mentioned like or contractors of yesterday with contractors of today and tomorrow you got my metaphor you knew where i was going uh you already mentioned private equity you already mentioned how you know you you think that you know walmart and amazon in the next 10 you know, five, 10, 15 years are really going to be providing these in-home services. Are there any other types of future commercial trends that you're really kind of keeping your eye on and you think are going to affect the industry? Oh, that's a good question. I think uh, bringing that live video feed to not only the residential, but the commercial industries, there's a huge opportunity there. And, you know, it's really sad. Uh, service work really gets the short end of the stick, right? So I, I've worked uh, in big commercial work. Um, the last project, uh, well, actually, since we started this company, I was hired to do a consulting project um, at a Chevron uh, project down in Texas. And it was a $320 million construction project. When you spend $320 million to build a building, there's a lot of technology there. I mean, everybody's using a tablet and everything, smart rooms and the whole nine yards. The problem is in service work, everything's a, you know, 50 to $500 ticket. Nobody wants to spend any money. And mm -hmm. that's really where we've, um, we, it, it, we kind of looked at that in the beginning too. And you, you asked me, uh, there was several factors why we chose the uh, commercial over the residential definitely me not wanting to be mixed up with the customer's emotion was a big piece of that but we figured if we could work for you know the biggest hardest to work for companies that wanted it done right and were willing to pay maybe not the highest dollar amount but for it but a little bit more of a premium if we could build efficiencies in to get the profit out, that would give us money to just pour into the technological development that needed to bring the industry forward. So that's probably a big piece of that. Got it. So company, com companies like yours, contractors today should really be looking where, where they can free up budget so they can invest in more technological solutions. 
Yeah, and that's, uh, I, I've noticed that it's not happening very quickly. So I, I will tell you, that's one of the biggest things we do, uh, or that I do personally, is that consulting to help the businesses streamline their efficiencies. And to give you an, an example, um, we took a project last year, uh, it was $900 per location. And it, uh, it was 1734 locations in 50 states. And everybody said, there is no way you're going to make money on that project. And we went out and we built every single truck uh, to be perfectly systemized. And, and we, leaned, we went straight to Henry Ford for this. We read books, we looked at how he ran the factory floor, and we tried to limit the amount of movements that it took the technician to perform the work. So the same mm. work 1,730 times. And we organized the trucks perfectly. We shadow boxed all the tools the same way you would do in the Air Force or the aviation industry. And uh, we supported them with live video. And then uh, we trained them to be very intentional in their movements. When they came out of the truck, first thing you do is this, then you do this, and then you do this, and then you go to your job and you do this, this, and this. And uh, we ended up, uh, turning a 70% profit margin on that project nationwide. And people thought we would, couldn't make a dollar on it, right? Because, and I mean, if you just went to do one, you probably wouldn't, but it was about building that efficiency. And uh, we, we realized at that moment, coupling the technology with the efficiencies training was a huge opportunity uh, to, to move the industry forward. So, you know, the price keeps going up and up and up, but, the price should be going down with the advent of technology, right? So, yeah. Interesting. It, it, Henry Ford, uh, I really have took appreciation away from something that he says, uh, he said in his book, and it was, um, you know, he would go to the team and he'd say, hey, I want to lower the cost of the car. And they were like, there's no way we won't make money. And if they wouldn't tell him how they were going to do it, he would just lower the cost of the car to whatever he thought it should be. And he would make them go find the efficiencies to make it profitable. And that's exactly how we run our entire business. So. Dang. Wow. Uh, the, that's the, really efficiencies are, the efficiencies are there, but you have to innovate to get them. I absolutely love that. Uh, it's a very, it's a contrarian point of view. I haven't heard it before. Uh, so always, always refreshing. You mentioned, um, you know, that you guys have been pivoting. You've done a lot of change. Seems like you adapt a lot. Were you guys impacted by COVID at any point, um, given the kind of, because you do, to my understanding, like full service maintenance on like different facilities management. So plumbing, electrical, fixture replacement, that kind of stuff, right? Definitely. So um, our projects department was brought to uh, like a complete halt. And that was because uh, nobody knew what to do and they just wanted to freeze the budgets up and they weren't sure what was going to happen. But on the facility side, um, it was higher, higher, higher. So uh, being that we're supporting uh, some of the frontline retailers of the nation, um, it was instantly apparent that they weren't uh, going to slow down. Um, and it, it was actually kind of nice because they stopped uh, operating 24 hours a day. So um, we probably saved some payroll uh, there because we weren't operating 24 hours a day, but we were still having to schedule uh, some night work. We, we will not shut a customer's uh, water off, especially a 24 hour facility, uh, unless mm -hmm. it's on off peak time. So between 11 and 4 AM is about the only time we do water shutdowns for our customers. So, um, you know, something else I, I'd, I'd bring the industry, uh, especially for plumbers out there. Um, freezing, pipes. Uh, it, it's kind of in the oil and gas industry, it's more common, uh, especially for freezing bigger lines, but we freeze a lot of uh, pipes. It's uh, probably like 30, $35 to freeze a two inch line somewhere around there. And it saves our customers so much headache of having to shut an area of a building down or an area of a facility or, or whatever it is. So we'll just freeze a section of line that we need to work on. And that's been hugely beneficial. I, I wish everybody would do that. And uh, that, that's something I think that a whole bunch more people need to do. It, it blows my mind when I talk to plumbers that have been doing this work for 30 years or, or even are on cutting edge of some things and like, they don't know about this thing. I'm like, how do you guys not know about that? 
So, uh, so opposed anyway. to actually shutting down the entire water system, you're just freezing the section that you're working on so the rest of the operation doesn't get interrupted. 100%. And I think that uh, more and more contractors should lean on that. It, it, and it's all about customer service, right? Uh, everybody hears uh, me all the time. There's only a couple things that matter to me. Uh, the four cornerstones of sales are, are one of them, right? So selection, do you have lots of products to offer? Availability, uh, can you deliver them now? Um, price, are you the cheapest or, you know, it, it's okay to be the best, but it's best to be the best and cheapest, right? And then yeah. uh, cu customer service. So um, if your customer complains, give them their damn money back. And if you, I studied uh, every uh, Fortune one company that's probably came up through the ranks since the 20s uh, or since they've been ranked, but I, I looked way back. And I wanted to understand what made these companies tick. And that was the thing that I found between all of them was the four cornerstones of sales. Any company that ever got that right stayed at the top for a long time. So we really, really push on that. And, and Walmart's a great, great example of that. And uh, Sears had it right for a long time, but then they, they forgot to change when the world changed on them. And Amazon, if you look at Amazon, I mean, they're no different than, than Sears, right? Yeah. Um, and I tell people that all the time. They're like, what do you mean? Well, <laughs> they, give you, they give you a catalog, you order what you want, you pay them and they ship it to you. I mean, that was the Sears Roebuck model in the, in the 1800s, right? Up into the, into the 1900s. So um, it's just, they, they had the advent of technology to go with it, which I think is amazing. I, I'm a huge, I love the technology. I wish it was in everything. I could tell. I think it's awesome too. Um, you've mentioned already, you know, Henry Ford, you mentioned that you've studied every business in Fortune One, you mentioned Emith. What other leader, I love asking for book recommendations. I love asking for like resource recommendations. Are there any books or, you know, speakers or leaders that come to mind that you think folks should definitely follow, read? Oh, a hundred percent. Give me two <laughs> Yes. Uh, no worries. I'm, I'm going to look them up right now, but I'll, I'll give you a bunch that I think are great for, for contracting, especially. Um, Jim Collins. I really like Jim Collins. That guy, he, he's the one that really got me into studying the different um, businesses and what makes them tick. He wrote a good to great. And that he, this guy, I don't know how many tens of thousands of research hours they spent in order to, you know, figure out what made a company go from good to great from a leadership standpoint, from a business standpoint, but he tears it apart. And they're easy reads, you know, you can kind of pick and choose uh, what, what you want to read from those guys and, and really get a, a good grasp of what's going on. So uh, Jim Collins, amazing. And then uh, again, Henry Ford's My Life and Work. What an amazing um, piece of literature. The things that he covers in there were so forward thinking. It's beyond me how more of them are not uh, like everyday practices. The Walmart Way, excellent book for process and procedure to get it right. And, you know, this is something that I probably learned from studying Walmart the most. And everybody's like, oh, you're, you're kind of a copycat when it comes to Walmart. Yeah, they're Fortune 1. So when they're not ranked anymore, you let me know and I'll stop copying them. Uh, and he, uh, Sam Walton, he wrote in his biography that, uh, you know, he didn't think he ever had an original idea. He just copied what everybody else was doing that seemed to work and put it all together. And when you read uh, the Walmart way, they go through these uh, nine or 11 uh, business principles that, that Henry Ford laid out or that uh, Sam Walton laid out for them. And it's amazing how simple they are. And it was probably that one book that opened my eyes up to people just don't have the discipline to do the simple things. And mm. if you can have the discipline to just do the simple things and they seem so simple, it's like, no, oh, that's, everybody wants to reinvent the wheel, right? And uh, the yeah. wheel doesn't need to be reinvented. You, you just got to have the discipline to do the simple things. And that, that's probably the biggest, biggest takeaway with that. Um, if we're talking about uh, kind of those forward thinking management styles, which I know you guys got to have a ton of young contractors 
uh, in the mix or, or people, kids that are taking over the businesses or, or buying businesses. But um, The Startup Way uh, by Eric Ries, um, Scrum by Jeff Sutherland, uh, The Age of Agile, uh, excellent book is The Lean Startup, another one by Eric. Um, how Google works, another one that are just really, really solid things. Uh, for all the Elon Musk haters out there, if you read The Art of Getting Money by P.T. Barnum, he's like the perfect example of that book. Just goes around <laughs> making tons of noise. Don't get me wrong, super talented, uh, probably one of the smartest people on earth currently, but um, he's definitely an engineer running the company, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> zero, to, zero to One by Peter Thiel, mm -hmm. one of my favorites. I've heard good things about that book. Um, that's definitely on my list, but, uh, thank you for all these recommendations. And if you have more, feel free to email them to me because whenever we do these podcasts, we always have a, a, a page where we kind of dive deep into, you know, the key takeaways. And I always have a recommended reading section. So please, if you've got Roughly. a litany, send them my way. Um, uh, go for it. What other, one other one I'll give you. And, uh, I, I, some of the people that are more on the, the religious side, it's really not my cup of tea, but uh, there's a lot to be learned there. Uh, Dave Ramsey, from a, he wrote a book called Entre Leadership, and it, it's a little bit on the biblical side, but that is an excellent playbook for anybody starting a business. Um, we started this business with the uh, Entre Leader in hand, and uh, I, I mean, I'll give him complete credit for being debt free. Uh, he definitely did so, but we did such a good job of, uh, of uh, opening with that, that we got invited to, um, to his building there in uh, Nashville twice. And that, that was really uh, fun. And something that's a little bit more biblical than that, I know, I know on the trades, there's a lot of people um, that, that have a lot of faith, but The Legend of the Monk and the Merchant, excellent book that just has solid uh, business principles for people. That's really great. Thank you for those. Um, you think a lot, you read a lot, you've sold three businesses. Can you think of a moment in your career in terms of starting up these businesses as a contractor where you really kind of had an aha moment or you learned something that, you know, you mentioned before, you know, people don't like to do the simple stuff. I like to reinvent the wheel. Was there like one concrete lesson that you learned in your history that really just sticks out as like, man, if I knew this when I was younger? Well, I wouldn't say that if I learned it when I was younger, probably the biggest uh, blessing that I had was that when I was the summer uh, that I was 18, I got my contractor's license when I turned 18. And uh, that first year, it was it was busy. I was going to that school for six months and I was working back and forth and having a good time. And it was that summer uh, that I turned 19. Um, I had got uh, ahead of myself a little bit. I... <clears throat> bought a van then i bought two vans and i bought some equipment and we were painting all these uh, track homes and uh, we had about nine of them painted and we'd been paid for about one of them and the contractor uh he ran off and he didn't pay any of these uh any of the con uh, subcontractors and I, I was very fortunate uh, you asked like how i learned so much about business and mostly reading um very fortunate uh, that i that i if I can't figure it out or I don't know the answer, I want to know the answer and I'll go find it. But uh, I, I lost that company that summer. I was 19 and it was more like in the fall by the time it really got bad. But uh, this contractor run off and I had all these houses painted on credit and it was like the only work I had. So I went to uh, the paint store where I bought my paint and I, I talked to this guy. Uh, his name was Bob. And I said, hey, uh, you know what? Um, what can I do, man, to get out from under this? And he's all, man, Justin, you probably need to, to give up back all that equipment, you know, and just start from ground zero. And that was probably a, a, a really defining moment in, in understanding uh, how things work. And I was fortunate that I learned that lesson young and not, to, not later it gave me the ability to learn how to negotiate with creditors and to negotiate with um, the bank and with suppliers. And I, I mean, I didn't have a choice. I had to call them and tell them like I screwed up and that I needed to, to figure out how to pay them back. And um, 
paying people back for things you don't own, that's a bunch of crap as far as I'm concerned, um, especially when they've taken it back from you, right? So I, I didn't quite agree with that, but I said I would never do that again. And um, I've, I've been very fortunate to, to build everything uh, super cash flush and from a very profitable standpoint so that I didn't have to, to deal with that again. But um, th that was definitely a, a defining moment for uh, why I am the way I am and why I'm kind of debt adverse. And I, I don't mind OPM like other people's money, but you don't want to be stuck with a, a huge bill every month if you're on uneasy ground, especially for a startup company, right? Totally. So, uh, and, and I mean, when you're young, they'll push money on you like crazy. Everybody is willing to give you money. I, I think well, that's because you got a whole life ahead of you to pay it off. <laughs> um, all right. Incredible. This has been a, this has been an illuminating conversation, Justin. I have some rapid fire questions I did not send to you beforehand that you just don't think answer. Um, but before we get to that, is there anything else that you want to talk about that we haven't talked about already? You know, the only thing I'll, I would ask every contractor is just communicate, communicate with your customer, uh, communicate with your, your creditors, communicate with everybody, especially, and this is the thing um, that, I, that I think that gets overlooked a lot. When you're starting businesses and when everything's going great, you know, it's all fun and games. Every, everybody's happy, go lucky. But when it gets tough uh, and, you know, you're not making those bills that you got to make and you're not doing... Uh, everything that, that needs to be done or, or one of your customers gave up on you or one of your customers didn't pay you, especially in residential. I've been in that boat a bunch. Uh, it, it's just communicating with everybody involved and letting them know what's going on and really reaching out. Um, and I, I think that contractors more than any, any other uh, industry probably suffer from that the most is they're, they're always just left out to dry and and communication is not a big part of what we do, right? We're just expected to be the trade expert and go do what we're supposed to do and be perfect at it and, and get zero support from, from everybody else. So like I said, just communicating with, with people openly and honestly when things get rough is probably the best piece of advice I can give anybody. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Thank you. All right, you ready for some rapid fire questions? Let's do it. How do you take your coffee? Milk only. If you could have dinner with one person, dead or alive, who would it be? Elon Musk, alive, Benjamin Franklin, dead. What's the number one thing you're trying to learn more about right now? Good question. Uh, merger and acquisition. Mm. If money weren't an object, so if you had unlimited resources, what's the first thing you would do? That's a good question. I can't answer that one yet. Give me that one at the end. <laughs> okay, you want to pause? Uh, okay, then the, the final question is, what's the number one thing every contractor should do to run a successful business? Oh, man. Over communicate and get lots of training and help. Yeah, people usually close their, their episode with that one. Uh, so I have to cut that one. But uh, no, 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 in, no insight on the if money weren't an object, if you on unlimited resources. Uh, Man, I don't know. I don't put a whole bunch of value on money, honestly. I, uh, I, am, I, I respect it because I live in a capitalist society, but I have no loyalty to it whatsoever. It just uh, totally. it, it, you cr create more value than you take from society and you can have anything you want. Yeah, I actually agree with that. It's more like if you didn't have to worry about paying your bills, what would you do? I'd probably go to work for SpaceX and build things that fly. Oh, well, next time you're in LA, we need to, uh, we need to get together because I know a couple of people in SpaceX. So maybe we can make that's that happen great. for you. It's fun. Uh, <laughs> um, if COVID ever lets up, we'll get there. Oh, that would be fantastic, man. Uh, who knows? But we will see. Uh, Justin, thank you so much for chatting with me today. This was a really wonderful episode and I really enjoyed getting to know you. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Jackie. You guys are doing great work over there and uh, I, I'll continue to follow you. Keep uh, doing all the great things that you're doing as well. Ever wonder how much your business is worth? So many owners ask that question and have no idea where to turn for an answer. In just a few clicks, Service Titan's new Service Business Valuation Calculator can give you an easy and free estimate of the current value of your business. Whether you're thinking about selling your company or looking to track growth, check it out now. Visit servicetitan.com slash value. Again, that's servicetitan.com slash value. See how much your business is worth today. 
Want to network with fellow service entrepreneurs and former guests of this podcast? Join our private Facebook group, Toolbox for the Trades, to get immediate access to the best tips, tricks, and tactics from fellow service entrepreneurs. Visit facebook.com slash group slash toolbox for the trades, or click the link in our show notes to join. See you online.